please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. So Dr. Sarathi, uh, Professor Sarathi, let's go ahead and get started. Why don't you just give a quick little background about, um, you know, your work and your work with Peer Buddies, which is now going into the Awake Peer Mentor Program, so everyone can hear, can understand its uh, origins quickly. Absolutely. Um, uh, the uh, peer uh, buddy program, as you call it, or the peer driven um, intervention program is a program that we developed using funding originally from the Veterans Affairs and subsequently from PCORI, which is the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And it's meant to uh, train the trainers, train patients who can actually provide better care uh, to patients. And it's not so much care, but they share with them their. Uh, personal experiences and the personal barriers that they encountered and how they overcame those barriers. So they almost end up acting as a coach, uh, like a life coach. And uh, this is very similar to peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer support in various other disease conditions like diabetes and heart failure and, uh, and such. Um, but it's all meant to be able to share cross-pollinate um, tips and tricks as to how people are able to overcome uh, their um, ability to uh, uh, use the CPAP machine on a regular basis and get the best that they can from uh, CPAP related treatment. Yeah, I think we're all familiar with, um, you know, uh, uh, patients, uh, their struggles and their hurdles in the beginning. And, you know, the American Sleep Apnea Association for years has had the awake network, the awake groups, alert well and keeping energetic. And those were in person, patient you know, patient to patient support peer groups, you know, to help with all of those little tips and tricks. And then um, the best thing about this program that, you know, that uh, Dr. Partha Sarathi brought to us is um, it's going virtual now, you know, since COVID uh, uh, hit and, you know, people are not, you know, maybe you're having telemed appointments with your doctor, you're not even going into the the, the doctor's office um, through the help of, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Partha Sarathi and the rest of the team at the ASA, you know, this is providing over the telephone peer support. So, um, you know, we are, there's, you know, kind of two aspects of the program, and I'll let um, Dr. Partha Sarathi picked this up, but you know, there is the part that the ASA is looking for the mentors, looking for the experienced patients that um, you know, want to be those coaches and want to be the person that's, you know, receiving or making the calls and you know has 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 had success with their therapy. And then there's the side of all of the patients that, you know, that that we're looking um, that need help. You know, and they don't have to be super newbies. I mean, they could have had the machine for six to eight months and they're still, you know, struggling with it. They can't figure this out. Why isn't this working? The tube, you know, all those things. So um, you want to touch on that part a little bit, how the how the program is is set up and, and working with the two different yeah. types of individuals? Yeah, I have some uh, slides that I can share if that's okay. Sort of, uh, is that something I can uh, share, Justine, so that mm -hmm. I can walk us through what is at stake and what are some of the processes? And I promise <laughs> won't take too much time to allow Q and A. Yeah, can you share them, or or is it not saying? Oh, yeah, you can. Okay, good. I thought you'd be able to. Okay. Good. So the yeah. So this is the program in terms of you know being able to disseminate and implement uh, what were the our research uh, you know findings that we have done. Um, to be able to benefit patients. Most times um, people do, uh, you know, researchers do research, but it really doesn't come to benefit people. And I think we live during the COVID pandemic where scientific advancements and research is immediately uh, helping and benefiting uh, people uh, in all walks of life. Um, so that's the, you know, sort of the uh, primary intent with which we, you know, develop the brand. Uh, so, you know, one of the key things that we need to understand is what's at stake is that from a patient-centered care or patient experience standpoint, people, um, based on our research, we have seen that people um, have sleepiness or sleep apnea-related symptoms that, that they suffer from for over 10 years before they actually get the diagnosis. So there's delayed diagnosis uh, of this condition to begin with. 
And in a physician's office, not all physicians really ask people about their sleep apnea-related symptoms. Um, it's sort of almost like a don't ask, don't tell situation where uh, there's no sleep questions that are part of standard reviews of systems where they ask, what else is going on with you? I know you're here today for your blood pressure, uh, but do you have, have you been losing weight? How is your appetite? Things like that. But they normally ask, they don't ask the questions at all uh, in general, or a majority of physicians don't because they never got the training, um, you know, when they went to med school uh, because sleep is such a, you know, young field. But even after they get, you know, suspected of having sleep apnea and they're referred to sleep lab at night or overnight stay or need to walk to navigate their way to a sleep hot, um, clinic, uh, you know, there is a little bit of barriers there, transportation, coming there at night, knowing where to go um, and, and things of that nature. So there's some fear, trepidation, even after they get to the sleep lab, some of them are so anxious that they're not able to actually sleep because they've been worried about whether they'll get there on time and find the right place because, it's again during the night, not during the day. Of course, that's uh, sidestepped uh, in home sleep studies. Um, but, you know, sleep study is not a pleasant experience. Uh, you know, you have to wear a lot of probes and electrodes. So, the, you know, it's not like having a blood test and knowing whether your blood sugar is under control or not. It requires a you know, major part on the patient to be able to sleep with all of these instrumentations in a foreign bed or take, the, take it home and being able to sleep at home because there's no blood test that's been invented or discovered for diagnosing sleep apnea. And uh, CMS rule says that we can't have the results available immediately. We're not supposed to, the commission's not supposed to tell the patient according to ASM accreditation standards and such the results because you know it can be miscommunicated because it's only a licensed physician or provider that needs to interpret that. But there's a lag time there because it's a thousand pages, 1200 pages worth of study that needs to be interpreted. So there's usually a wait time involved, which is again, not very patient centered because the patient gets the test and they're waiting, waiting, waiting as to whether sometimes they don't get a call, uh, they're supposed to their doc primary care doctor, and then they don't hear from that. So there's fragmentation of care. And let's say they get diagnosed with sleep apnea. There are lots of DME companies, especially during COVID times, that are dropping off CPAP machines, drop shipping them, and there is not much you know, education about how to turn the machine on and how to turn off. And part of that also, besides COVID, prior to COVID, there were these TARC laws, the governmental laws that prevented a sleep center from having the conflict of interest of actually also being in the job of dispensing machines. And so what that does is it further fragments, you know, the care. So the patient experience, you know, the later, uh, you know, a diagnosis, uh, difficulty with doing the sleep diagnostic test, you know, delayed results, and then there is the DME TARC laws, and then you got the machine. Now, sleep, sleep apnea is the only disease condition where it requires a, a complex external device-based treatment that requires a patient to be savvy with the machine, that requires behavioral change that they would wear, have to wear it every night. So essentially, a third of their life after they get diagnosed with sleep apnea, they have to be wearing this device. You know, the, there are other devices that are implanted in people. And it works on its own. No one has to actually apply it on their face or apply it on their face for hours on end. So even if it's like a exercise machine or something, you know, they exercise for 30 minutes, not for seven hours at nighttime. So this is the only condition that requires this continuous application of an external device that requires behavioral modification. Right there is the barrier. And that's right there we are unique in terms of the care delivery or the treatment or the patient is different than any other patient. You know, I've been told always that, oh, you always say that you're special, you're different. <laughs> you know, that the sleep center and the sleep medicine area is special and it's different. It, it really is for these reasons, <laughs> you know, and they, they don't understand. And with that comes baggage, that with that comes new barriers that we really that did not anticipate in other medical conditions or other, other clinics, be it in a heart clinic or a cancer clinic or whatnot. So it's a complex external device-based therapy that requires daily wear and behavior change. And so that's where the complexity lies. And so with all of this, you know, on top of everything, just to lay it on thick, if someone is non-adherent the first 90 days, the CPAP benefits is removed. Uh, they, they start getting bills now, uh, full bills, where the insurance company is not picking up the rest of the tab, and this is the 90-day rule. And it's just not CMS for Medicare, Medicaid patients. Other insurers are also picking up on this, TRICARE and other insurances. 
uh, are using the 90 day policy to say that if you don't use it in the first 90 days up to this magical mark, we're going to take it away. The issue is that they don't do that for blood pressure medications. They don't do it for cholesterol medications. They don't do it for other medications. Pill boxes accumulate, inhalers accumulate, nobody cares except for CPAP machines where they care about it. And so that results in a lot of stress and, you know, where they are actually having to pay all of these bills. So it's on um, the experience, patient experience is complicated by man-made rules and regulatory policies. So there's delayed diagnosis, fragmented care, silos of care delivery, and this is a complex device-based uh, therapy that's external to the body, requiring behavioral change, and then you've got loss. Uh, like stark laws and all of that that compound and make it more complex. So to address this, uh, you know, we actually, uh, you know, uh, created a study design and we just didn't come up with a study design. We actually involved all of these stakeholders. It's a different way of doing research, which is the patient-centered way of doing research, is that we don't decide all of a sudden, oh, I had this idea as a researcher, I was listening to a talk or reading a paper. Oh, I've got an idea. I'm going to go do research on this. That's not how this works. This is we engage stakeholders saying, what is your issue here? What is the patient's issue here? What is the uh, payer's issue here? What is the uh, provider's issue here? What is the society's issue? What is the American Sleep Apnea Association as a public advocacy position? What is your issue here? We take all of that and we came up with a study design. We got input from all of them. We're working with uh, the American Sleep Apnea Association you know, at the start of the study and with essentially the conception of the study where we put all the, you know, you know, the eyes, nose, the, you know, ears and everything together. And then uh, we said, okay, it's like, you know, taking wedding vows, you know, speak now, or hold your breath forever, <laughs> study initiation. Then we kick-started the study. Until then, we had a lot of modifications that we did to the study, and then we conducted the study. And even the stakeholders were involved with the conduct of the study. You know, DME companies helped recruit patients for us. Uh, you know, the ASA gave us input as to how, you know, we should be able to help retention prevent patients from dropping off the research study, and also are giving us ideas as to this space. You know, once we started finding the study finding, how are we going to disseminate and implement this? You know, then they spoke about the patient groups that they interact with and how this can be disseminated as a training program for people to become peer mentors if the study's findings were positive, if it shows that it actually works. So we needed to show, first of all, that it works before we start disseminating and implementing, which is what I'm going to show you with the next few slides. So the way this works is that you have a peer buddy who's a trained uh, patient with sleep apnea who's been doing a good job using their CPAP. They're here in more than four hours a night, seven nights a week. And um, they get about do's and don'ts. You know, you're not a medical doctor. You're not appreciating your personal life experiences. It's no different than a support group for, you know, lung cancer or a support group for transplantation or a support group. No different than that. It's essentially... A one-on-one -on -one support group, that's what it is. It's not about delivering care and things. So if there's any medical questions that come, the peer buddy should inform the participant that you need to talk to your doctor about this. All I can tell you is about how I helped, uh, you know, make this machine help me. And so you, you, you have a part in this as well. This is what I did. You know, learn from what I did. And if you need more help, go find someone else. So the IVR system allowed the patient to either reach the peer buddy or the peer buddy to reach the patient the IVR system in our second iteration, what we did was we allowed it based on input, we allowed it to be able to call these various entities like a sleep technician to go over the sleep study report, a DME company to get an extra mask or a doctor to get a prescription for a nose spray to help improve nasal congestion and improve urine, or even to the American Sleep Apnea Association with a patient call to the patient or advocacy organization. And what were the outcomes we looked at? We went through a lot of outcomes, should it be blood pressure, should it be hospitalization? Should it be CPAP adherence hours used per night? But then everyone uh, was asked to rate what are the outcomes that are important for me. And the one that got the most ratings was global patient satisfaction ratings of how the care delivery was uh, to them. In other words, as a customer, how satisfied are you with your overall global care delivery that was given to you, which is the sum of many, many parts. You know, uh, and we can talk about that, and it's a pretty complex issue. So patient ratings of satisfaction. If I went and bought a car, uh, the agent tells me, hey, you know what, you'll get a call in a week, tell them, give them 10, 10 for all, everything. My job depends on it. You know, and similarly, 
in healthcare systems, we know that the patient is the customer. And if we don't please the customer, if we don't please the patient, then we are not doing our job right because it's almost like uh, we are a customer service organization and uh, and that it's service oriented. And so a lot of payers are picking up on this. So they're gonna start rewarding practices that do a better job of getting higher patient rating satisfaction. We monitor this as part of an accreditation by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. We have to monitor our patient satisfaction rating on a 10 point scale, as well as how likely are they on a 10 point scale to refer our sleep center to a friend or family member. So we live and die by that. We monitor that on a quarterly basis. And so we really believe in that measure. And that was what the, was the measure that was the primary outcome. But also there are measures of how good was my care coordination. And also there are measures about how good is my assessment of you giving me care for my chronic illness. Because sleep apnea is a chronic illness. You know, once they get diagnosed, you can't get cured of it. You need continuous treatment in a chronic disease model for years to come, unless if someone were to dramatically lose weight and get rid of the sleep apnea, it's a chronic medical condition. And there are tools, questionnaires that can be used to measure how good that is. So we randomized, we approached 317 patients, 307 patients agreed to participate, 263 were randomized and met criteria. We had about 130 in each arm. And you can see about 110 to 117 completed. We had some attrition, some people dropped off the study. But interesting, 86% of patients that were approached were eligible subjects uh, to participate in the study, which tells you that it's pretty applicable to a lot of patients out there. And so when we looked at CPAP adherence, you can see that the people who are part of this PDIVR, which is the peer-driven intervention, which is a peer buddy program with the IVR system, which is the interactive voice response phone platform, um, actually we're using for, uh, the CPAP for more nights per, um, more hours or minutes per night. And the proportion of them were using it for more than four hours per night was also higher. And that's an important number. The important reason for the importance of that number is that remember, if they don't use it for that magical time period, the machine gets taken away from them. And when we looked at it that way, NNT means the number needed to treat. In other words, how many people we needed to put into that red um, group, which is the PDIVR group, how many people do you need to put it in that group for one person not to lose possession of their CPAP machine. So that's a pretty good NNT. In other words, if we put nine people in the red group, we can prevent one person from outright losing possession of the machine and not making this magical cutoff of four hours per night for five nights uh, per week. So uh, that's, that's, where, you know, um, uh, that's why it's relevant. You know, if you say, oh, more than 50 minutes per night of usage, well, what does that mean? Uh, which is what we found, about 53 minutes more usage per night. What does that mean to me? Uh, well, it means that one in nine people aren't going to lose their CPAP machine. Now, that, that's pretty you know, significant. So this is an infographic of our main findings. We found that you know, not only was there improved CPAP usage, which I sh showed in the previous slide, uh, the global patient satisfaction was greater uh, in these people. Uh, and there was, they also perceived that their healthcare was better coordinated and also their assessment of their chronic illness care was actually better. Uh, so this is something that uh, we found. Now, why is that important? Why do we need to move that forward? Is this really a problem with CPAP adherence? This is a nationwide representation of people using CPAP or not using CPAP. Um, this is based on their device, but we got this information from where the device sends the adherence information. This is about a, nearly a quarter million people out of which 170,000 people we have actual data on um, that was accurate for over 16 years of follow-up period. And we found that the blue dots were just as many as the red dots. In fact, the red dots were slightly more. There was 53% of people with CPAP in the country aren't using it like they're supposed to um, by Medicare criteria. And we say, okay, what are those zip codes in which they were living? Because we could geolocate where that machine was. And we know what zip code the machine was in. And when we geolocated and find out what's the median household income, we found that there was a health disparity of CPAP adherence. People in lower income zip codes were more likely to be non-adherent. So you have the lower CS on the left side going from one, two, three, four quartiles. You can see that there are blue bars, which are the non-adherent people. Lower CS uh, uh, residents were more likely to be non-adherent than people who are in the top bracket of median household income, suggesting that there is uh, that effect. So what we decided was we had these positive findings. We um, uh, talked to PCORI. We are implementing this across the Banner healthcare system, which spans about six states, neighboring states in the Southwest United States. 
uh, with um, uh, what was then 10 sleep centers, but now we have only nine sleep centers, one of the hospitals, you know, you know, disconnected with the union, so, so to speak. And so um, uh, we are disseminating that through the hospital system. But when COVID happened, we needed to disseminate this nationwide. Uh, and for that, we partnered with the American Sleep Apnea Association to create this uh, mentor, you know, program. So it, it was 11 actually in the past, and now it's 10, so it's down by one. And we did it in a what we call step wedge um, pattern. Essentially, it's like a train the trainer concept. We take some pa uh, for patients who are willing to be a peer buddy, to be a mentor. We train them, and then they in turn train three uh, mentors. So we, we train 120 people. They in turn train 360 people. And if each one of them were to train, you know, uh, you know, uh, about six participants each, you're talking about 2,000 patients uh, who will be benefit, uh, benefited by the program. So we're working with third-party payers like insurance companies about how we can move this needle forward and how we can get them paid for by the insurance. And uh, they are actually currently within the Bain Healthcare System paid by the insurance company for that. And so this brings me to this COVID pandemic. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, right, people aren't able to visit their doctors in person. They're doing remote calls. And I have patients that are seeing me in clinic remotely, and they say, well, I don't know which now, doc. And normally, they were asked to be bringing their machine with them during clinic. I can show them how to work the knobs and tell and look at the adherence information if they don't have a transponder, you know, if they have a chip that they're not being able to mail in. Uh, I can actually slap the mask on them and actually advise them uh, to just breathe and I can look for leaks and things like that. But I'm not able to do that during the COVID pandemic. And that's part of the reason why the Awake Peer Mentor Program is very important where uh, the doctor's office, we have barely 20 minutes for a follow-up patient and 40 minutes for a new patient who's actually not been diagnosed. And so there's not enough time in the world for us to talk to them about all the nuances about wearing CPAP, and all the tips and tricks that patients know. And that's a great opportunity for the mentor program where uh, the uh, patients who become experienced uh, uh, CPAP users are able to train other people. So this is a you know, dangerous condition, as you know, this is right out of the ASA website, uh, which is the Awake Peer Mentors Program. And the idea is for us to be able to train these uh, mentors. Uh, we have the same training we're doing locally within our healthcare system. We're doing it uh, nationally through with the you know through the ASAA. And what does a peer mentor do? Uh, they just talk about how to overcome hurdles of PAP therapy. And they talk about tips of improving therapy with their CPAP machine, how to navigate their treatment pathway, and uh, you know they serve as a positive and compassionate role model and share with them firsthand what was their journey like. It's almost like a coach saying that, okay, if I can do it and I can get to the other side of the river, so can you, you know? And uh, so it's a motivational, it's also tips and tricks and you know, knowledge about, you know, being able to put the cheek a pad if the strap is cutting into their face, you know, solutions to problems that only experienced users, you know, can actually know and share about. Uh, so how does one, you know, um, you know, register to become a peer mentor? They go to the, you know, website, uh, which I had on the previous website here. Uh, this is the web page that they can go to or just go to sleepapnea.org and go click on the peer mentors program on the menu toolbar. And it will take them to this particular page saying become a peer mentor. So if they're not already a member, they put their name and the phone, the email address and the phone number, and someone will give them a call to actually, you know, see if they're eligible to participate in the study. To be eligible, they just need to be an adult, and they need to be using CPAP on a regular basis and not be a shift worker and not travel too often that they can't serve as a mentor. And so once uh, that is in, they're able to serve as a mentor and and they get trained. We are right now in the phase of building these mentors, the number of mentors. Uh, but then very soon, we're going to go into a segment of where anybody and everybody who is a member of the uh, American Sleep Happy Association or patients that follow ASAA uh, on their Facebook and other social media, uh, if they're having trouble with their CPAP machine, they can actually reach out to the um, American Sleep Happy Association through their 1-800 number and say, hey, I'm a patient that's struggling with my CPAP machine. I'm looking for someone who could be my coach. Essentially, this is not different like a Peloton, you know, you know, a health coach or something like that, where you have someone helping someone else from at the distance. 
And yeah. so I'll so stop I, right there and see if there are any questions. Yeah, I was just I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that that our uh, attendees here know, just like you said, that, um, you know, they they register on sleepapnea.org. Um, and so uh, shift workers are not eligible to be uh, mentors and um, they need to be using a CPAP machine. So if they're using an oral, only an oral appliance or some other form of CPAP uh, therapy that that is out there, then they are um you know, not eligible, and and the website will will tell them that. If they are eligible, then we take such information as you know what, um, not zip code, um, time zone, the time zone that they're in, uh, their gender, because we like to try to match uh, females with females. We do take uh, their um, their uh, birth year because we try to put it like within a 10 year time range. So mentor would be of the same gender, uh, similar age group, uh, and so somewhat of the same time zone, obviously not the same state, but doesn't need to be. And, um, and then the training process that the mentor uh, receives are there's a series of videos that Dr. Partha Sarathi and his team have um, have done where it, you know, is showing the interaction. Obviously, this is when everything was face to face, showing the interaction of a mentor with a patient in front of them. This is what this knob does. This is what the humidifier. Are you, uh, you know, do you feel confident that you can, you know, perform this this exercise and these procedures at home? Do you feel confident after meeting with a things of that nature, showing that compassion and that that encouragement. And then um, there is also, oh, I forgot about the uh, quick interview with someone on the ASAA team. So we do speak to, our team does speak to each mentor before um, they are uh, labeled as eligible to participate in the program. You know, we just want to kind of get a feel for, for that experienced patient, you know, you know, hear their compassion in their voice, hear that they're going to be supportive, make sure that they, you know, understand the, the um, requirements of the program. And then that's when they become a peer mentor. Um, and right now, uh, with COVID being, um, you know, being out there, Dr. Partha Sarathi has uh, secured um, uh, $50 gifts for the first 2,000 eligible mentors. Um, and so that's an important thing to, to, to know. And again, as he said, you know, the other part of being the mentor is not just helping the patient, but, you know, to be that advocate that, you know, you know, your brother-in-law that lives a couple of states over, he's been using his CPAP. He's really great. Get him in the program. You know what I mean? Get him to be a mentor or, you know, your neighbor across the street or some person you work with, you know, they've been struggling send them over, you know, send them over as a patient, be like, here, call the ASAA, get, you know, get online. Um, you know, mentors can register on our website. Uh, patients can register for, uh, to receive a mentee on our website. All of that stuff is up and active and ready to go. Um, and uh, did I leave anything out about the mentors? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think you captured it all, uh, uh, Justine. I just wanted to say that there are a couple of questions in the uh, chat group. Um, uh, I think uh, what, the first one was uh, from David Bishop uh, asking about, you know, um, you know, is there going to be a structure to support us when we have questions from people we are hoping, we are helping, but we can't answer? Uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, it, it always, when in doubt, uh, remember, we are not, you are not, the mentors are not their uh, patient's primary you know, care provider. They're sharing with them tips and tricks. The default answer should always be, uh, you know, if there are any you know, questions that you're not able to answer, for them to talk to their doctor. Uh, so to me, that's always the best default that you can use without trying to take on something that may be beyond our scope, so to speak. And also we need to be respectful of the fact that you know, the other patient, they have their doctor or their provider, uh, could be a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, and we don't want to get in the middle of that and give a different opinion. Uh, and what we are sharing with them is, hey, how do you clean the machine? You know, how do you turn this on? How do you do the RAM? What, what were the things that motivated me? What motivated me is, as a, I mean, I'm not a grandfather, but I'm just telling you what a patient told me, which is, you know, um, after I started using the CPAP machine, I was able to spend more time with my grand uh, grandchildren. I was able to watch them while my, you know, daughter and uh, 
son-in-law were able to go to the movies, you know, for a date night or something like that. So I've had patients tell me that about how transformative uh, the CPAP machine has been. So it's all motivational. And uh, what, what is, um, you know, probably, uh, you know, something that would help uh, is, is that we have it scripted because the next question is, I see that they have a script. You know, can I get a script? The script was written for them to be able to get through those uh, you know, videos, uh, you know, not because they're not actors, uh, professional actors can memorize the script. Um, but there is a peer body training manual and uh, the peer body training manual is available with the American Sleep Apnea Association. And Justine, I don't know. It's on the website. Mm -hmm. If you go on the peer the mentor, website. if you go on the mentor page, there's a link there. And, and, you know, some of the bullet points, here's the manual. So you can take a look at, at the information there. Um, and, uh, and yeah. Yeah. And one thing I do also want to say is that um, Dr. Partha Sarathi and his team, he had mentioned the IVR system. And, and basically what that is, is just a telephone routing system. So so everybody's uh, cell phones and, and telephone numbers are confidential. The mentor gets a pin, the mentee gets a pin. We coordinate all of that. So you call this 800 number, you type in the pin, and Justine, you know, gets um, uh, 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 connected to Dr. Partha Arthur Sarathi's cell phone without me even knowing what his number is, you know, um, and so uh, what some of the other options on that calling system when they call is um, to get in touch with a um, sleep tech and a respiratory therapist, which are two individuals that work on Dr. Partha Sarathi's team. So, you know, once you're part of the program, you know, if when you call there, you can access your mentor or, you know, if you have a question about your sleep set or some, you know, you could leave either speak to the gentleman there or leave a message, he'll call you back or go ahead for the respiratory if it's a little. So there's some other options that the patient is able to receive, you know, maybe getting a little bit into David, I think that was a gentleman's name question, that, you know, if it's in those realms, maybe where a respiratory therapist could help or a sleep tech, you, you have those options there. But, you know, as the doctor said, um, you know, we're not, when it comes to that point, you know, you can refer them back to their, their medical doctor. Are there any other questions? Yeah, here? so I just wanted to I just wanted to go back to the you know the peer body training manual. The, the way the peer body training manual is structured is, is that it says phone call one, phone call two, phone call three, and each one of them has almost like a checklist of you know talk to them about how it improved your sleepiness. Talk to them about how you made a CPAP machine work into your busy life schedule. Talk to them about this and that. So you can ad lib that. We don't want to script it too much because then the spontaneity and the genuineness of the mentor gets lost, but it's more like a cue card, so, you know, saying, okay, in this phone call, these are the five, six things that you want to touch. And then we do that on a rotational basis. During the training, we use the peer body training and that's part of the training videos is so that people know what those each bullet points actually are, because we can't, we, you know, we want to be able to be a little bit more informative about it. Uh, you know, um, uh, there are patients of mine who have told me, no one ever told me that I'm an intrusive risk of stroke if I didn't use the CPAP machine. If someone had told me that, I would have done a better job because, you know, my grandfather had a stroke, my father had a stroke, you know, my great grandfather had a stroke. And so that would have been a big motivational factor. Why didn't anybody tell me that? Well, that's because we don't have enough time. You know, we, we're talking about this for an hour and we still aren't going to fully cover everything that we need to cover. <laughs> so, uh, that's where, you know, uh, you know, these support groups come in and we run a support group for lung transplant. And so past transplanted uh, persons and their family members meet with future potential transplant candidates and their family members. And there's a lot of sharing that's going on that escapes medicine because it's about how the patient handles their life. Where do they live? How do they commute when, the, when their near and dear one is in the hospital? things like that. There's a lot of moving parts to that, some of which even the provider does not know how to answer this question. And that's why that support group exists. And in that support group, you know, uh, they go on a first name basis, they introduce themselves, they tell them what their situation is, and they have a great conversation. And this IVR platform is meant to just to do that. So they're talking on a first name basis, they're not sharing phone numbers or where they live, but now this is happening in the virtual telephone world and not in person. Uh, to be able to do that, and that's one of the advantages.
Yeah. And I, I, and I like the fact that it is over the phone because, you know, that eliminates any other barriers with having a smartphone or internet or this or that or what have you, because, you know, that, you know, most people do have access to, to a telephone. Um, I did want to address on that topic. Um, David asked about you making the comment about effort to rec recruit more minority peer buddies. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's our, that's our outreach to you that's our outreach to you know the the, the network that ASA has from uh, professionals and clinicians and and uh, you know coaches that are that are with us is to you know help us amplify that message and get it out to everybody I mean we have we sent out in a previous email we have you know social media posts created for for you you know in the event that your practice or lab or doctor's office or whatever has social media accounts and that's what you use we have the graphics we have the posts you could just get that out there you could share whatever it is that we're doing. We created um, flyers with um, QR codes. Now, again, obviously flyers need to be in person, you know, uh, because, but the nice thing is, is that it tells an individual, if you have a smartphone, how you take a picture, you don't have to touch anything during the COVID. And it just, you know, takes you right to the registration and the information about peer mentors. Um, so we have all of that information. And if there's something that, you know, that you are thinking would be, helpful for you to to you know get this message out to to your patients and to your groups let let us know you know we're at asaa sleepapnea.org just be like hey can you make a flyer with this or can you do this because if you want it everyone else probably wants it as well so um you know we're we're able to get get those things out to you you know if you want an email with links if you communicate via email uh with your patients or something in a newsletter you know, just, just, just let us know. Um, Val had asked about um, when patients, mentees come through the program, can they eventually become a mentor? And the answer is yes. You know, if the patient comes through and they've been working for a couple of months and, you know, they work through their problem and now they're happy and, 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 and learn from the program and understand how to deal with the mass leaks and the hose gurgling and red marks on my face and my nose and all that other kind of stuff. And then they want to become a, a mentor. Of course. Yes. Yes. You know, we want them to be able to graduate and continue on through uh, through the uh, the program. And then, what is this, um, David? David uh, Bishop had a, another question, which uh, spoke to about um, you know whether the patient can send uh, their sleep doctor information about how they are there available to help and uh, can provide support. Um, but don't want uh, that to affect their relationship with their provider with regards to them being able to be in a position of giving advice. Uh, I want to say two things there. One is that, you know, any physician should understand that the uh, there is the practice of medicine and then there is the patient-centered um, approach of providing education, uh, just like how, you know, there are neighbors that talk to each other saying, okay, where did you go to get your, you know, COVID vaccine or you know, this or that, and they get that information and it's actionable information that actually, you know, ends up helping them solve a problem that they could not otherwise solve. Or they reach out to some friends to say, hey, what did you do in this particular scenario? And they give them advice and they ask a lot of people and then make a decision for their own, be it a healthcare decision or, or even, you know, where they are, are gonna get a loan refinanced or something. And so that, that's what this is, this is about you know, a community helping the community. And I don't think any provider should take that as an affront to their, you know, practice of medicine um, because they have plenty to do and they know that. <laughs> uh, the second thing is the ASA has made um, direct, uh, uh, directly approach the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which is the professional society for practicing uh, sleep clinicians to say, hey, we have this program, can you disseminate it to your patients? So it's going the other way around, where we are now asking you know, physicians to talk to their uh, uh, you know, patients that, hey, you're a great user of the CPAP machine and it looks like you're, you, know, you have time, you're retired, and you wanna help other people. Uh, here's an opportunity that, where you can help. So we are approaching it from the other end as well. Uh, um, I, I, I don't think this should affect the relationship because you're uh, essentially participating in a support group. 
And I think every uh, physician, and as a physician, I can tell you, I, for one, I, it just delights me when a patient says, oh, you know, I have uh, COPD. I'm actually going to join a support group to advise other patients how to help other patients. And actually, the whole idea for this study came from a, uh, a veteran, a patient of mine, who sat in front of me in the office. I can still remember uh, his face. I can't remember his name. Uh, this is, you know, about 10, 11 years ago. And he said, hey, doc, you know, this machine has just changed my life. And if there's anybody out there that's not using it, put them in front of me and I will teach them how to use this. So the, or, the originator for this idea was actually someone with sleep apnea. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, ASAA for, you know, over 20, possibly even 25 years had the, you know, awake network. Again, you're talking about uh, in, in, in person, patient to patient peer, peer group that a clinic would run or so on and so forth. And we would provide materials to the, um, you know, office manager or nurse, uh, whoever is there in regards to some, you know, information and material and, and materials that they can get out to their, to their patients. And this is just the, the a, a new iteration of that. Um, you know, those, those groups aren't meeting right now, but, you know, we all know that that sharing of just the basic, how do I overcome this initial hurdle with my machine, my mask, my hose, whatever, you know, that, that's the type of details that we're, that, that we're working on and, and, and dealing with here. And, and that, that having that experience of one patient to another is, um, you know, they have the time to talk and they're, and they're just like, you know, Dr. Partha Sarathi said that gentleman, his patient was so, interested in helping and wanting to and, and you know, tell all uh, how good it's going to be once you get over this hurdle, um, you know, that's not going to happen necessarily in the doctor's office right now. So this is this is what this program is here to do is here for. So, you know, we're looking for those mentors to come in because it, you know, it is a delicate balance because we the more mentors we have, the more patients we can help. So it's <laughs> it's getting getting those mentors in the program, you know, Watching a couple of the videos that um, Dr. Partha Sarathi's uh, team has put together is the training, you know, having the quick interview, they become eligible, they get the $50 gift, and then we start setting them up with, you know, with patients. And so it's that, like I said, that delicate balance, you know, we don't want to overload our mentors with too many patients, so we want to we want to build, build it up together. And we hope that the people will be able, the patients will be able to cross over, you know, into, um, you know, into becoming mentors once, once they, you know, figure out uh, their little tips and tricks. That's the whole point of how it's going to grow. Yeah. Uh, the one other thing I just wanted to add before you go to the next question is, is that um, in, in that research study, what I didn't share the data, um, uh, the findings were the mentors in our research study were also research participants. We looked at, uh, you know, their health-related quality of life and their CPAP use uh, when they became a mentor to when they finished their two-year stint being a mentor. And uh, what we found was their CPAP adherence was already good. That's why they came, became a mentor, because for someone to be a mentor, they need to be doing a good job using a CPAP. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be, you know, not right. Um, but we found that their CPAP adherence did not change, but their health-related quality of life went up. And we always heard anecdotal reports from these mentors saying, you know, I feel like I'm useful to society. I feel good. There's a feel good feeling, uh, you know, for me participating in that because I feel like I'm helping other people. And so that's why we put those measures in there. And we found that their health rate, quality of life, their quality of life went up, but it was not explained by changes in their CPAP usage, which means that by helping people, they felt better. And so, uh, and we have evidence for that, which is very, very cool. Sorry, yeah. back to you, just. Yeah. yeah, no, it's great. Exactly, that's a very good point. You know, you're you're paying it forward, and you you know are able to, uh, you know, recoup that feeling of 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 being helpful and getting someone. To, and and everybody wants to hear. You know, you talk with somebody, and you know, and they might even you know call you back and be like, "Oh, I made it through all last night. I slept all last night with my mask on." You're just as happy for them as they are excited. <laughs> about, you know, overcoming, overcoming that hurdle. And that's just, you know, that's, that's a good feeling. 
And, uh, and, and, and so I think that, are there any other questions that people have? Please put them in the chat. Any specific questions about the program or the materials? I mean, we do have all of the intake um, information for mentors and patients on our website. But by no means do we want to, you know, if someone doesn't have access to the internet, they can call the uh, uh, 888 number for the ASA. I don't know what it is. Maybe one of my team members that's here can put it in the chat. <laughs> you know, so they, you know, because everything is kind of done over the telephone. And so if a patient in need, you know, cannot enroll online, that's fine. You know, have them call. Uh, our, our customer service team can get them set up, get them a PIN number. You know, usually those things are all done, you know, via emails and all that other kind of stuff, but we definitely can make do and um, and because uh, we don't want them to go, you know, without support. So if that if that's a hurdle, don't let it be. You know, they can call us. Their Val went ahead and, and, and put the 888 number to contact um, the ASAA, uh, you know, if, if that's necessary. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to what Ms. Uh, Carol McCann commented, you know, uh, where, you know, it took uh, her nine months to get settled and functional with the mask and that she's very excited about this. And that's the kind of giving sentiment that we've heard from other mentors is uh, we've all, they always tell us that at an opportune moment that, you know, I wish I had this program for me when I started using this machine. Uh, but still, nevertheless, they're very giving people where they say, okay, I know I did not have the support, but I want to make sure other people have the support and the benefit of me sharing that, you know, information with them. And I don't know if uh, the 888 number will show up in the uh, recording on the chat, but it's 888-293-3650. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Justine. Yep, yep. Thank you, Sarah. She, uh, uh, she sent me a message about helping to get out some flyers to, you know, other professionals and so on that she knows. I appreciate that help, Sarah. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's probably our other, you know, uh, uh, ask of the individuals here is to help, you know, promote the program within your own networks. I mean, it's here. It's, it's free. Uh, you know, mentors right now have the ability to get the the, the gift, uh, so that's you know that's an added bonus. And um, and and yeah, I mean, you know, we're we we are here. Dr. Par uh, Partha Sarathi got this program together to to help people, and so we just we want to get it out there. We want to get it communicated, so um, you know we can help as many people as possible. So that's just the intention of you know today's chat, so you can learn about it. And if, like I said before, there's any tools that would help um, you in amplifying the program, whether it's to patients, mentors, you know, other uh, healthcare professionals, let us know. You know, our, um, the team here at ASA is happy to, you know, work with you on that and get something that's going to be useful to make sure that um, the program's out there and, and, and gets recognized. And yeah, there's a comment uh, um, uh, from uh, Debbie McCormick, McCormick uh, who talked about how, you know, we uh, um, meetings are happening in Zoom currently, and we totally support that. Uh, uh, this program is just meant to lend some structure. It's not meant to take anything away from ongoing Zoom awake programs. And so if you have that uh, going on, power to you. Um, but the original founder of the American Sleep Apnea uh, uh, Association going way back <laughs> uh, was actually a member of, uh, uh, assisted us with a research study of administering the surveys. When I mentioned this sort of a concept uh, uh, to him, he had said, well, you know, we've been doing this as part of a big group side, you know, it's like a group uh, session, group support at a local public library or a place of worship. Uh, so I know what you're not doing, what you're doing is not something, you know, highly innovative or novel, but it would help for us to get the evidence, the research evidence to show that that is meaningful, that it does indeed help improve sleep appearance, that it does indeed improve the patient experience. So, and he was very supportive of that along with uh, CPAP Joe, who is actually the founder of the CPAP.com website. And he offered to help and put some of his surveys on his uh, CPAP.com website at one point in time. Um, so uh, completely in agreement that this is meant to supplement all of the good work that's being done out there. This is not meant to be a one way of doing this. There are many ways, many roads to Rome, so to speak. Uh, and this is just one. And is this something that lends to your workflow? And this is something that you can adopt 
uh, that's uh, you know just wonderful. Uh, but if you have something that works, uh, that's wonderful too. Uh, you know, not, not not meant to take anything away from uh, the programs that existed before even we developed this program. Yeah, and we understand um, that um, you know people patients want to use the platforms or networks and that that they're comfortable with. You know, we have a Facebook group. Um, but not everybody's on Facebook. We have a forum on our website. You know, some people, you know, ha have have their network and ties to their awake group. Other people, you know, in other places might not have that option. So, you know, it's it's having that availability and all those diff you know different sources that someone can find the help that they need, the help that they need. You know, it's um, yeah. So that's, you know, just, just, we just want to make sure that everybody knows what's, what's out there. Um, David mentioned something about, you know, ongoing development with the ASM and, and yes, you know, uh, our organization is working with them. We're, like I said, uh, working with uh, Dr. Sai here, we're getting information to all those professionals there about the program as well. So, um, you know, we'll be doing that. And then. Yeah, I just want uh, is that the ASM had previously formed a patient uh, alliance called the American uh, Apnea Health Alliance or AASC. Um, and Justina may be getting the abbreviations wrong, but uh, that uh, group um, um, dissolved. Um, I think they have uh, some sustainability issue. And so the American Academy of Sleep Medicine is in conversation with the ASA uh, about how we can help patients through the ASM. So to answer your question, um, uh, this is something that, that we are, is being proposed to the ASM for them to take the lead on it, to be able to do that skill development stuff and be able to bring it under their umbrella as well. And that kind of buy-in is very key, we think, because uh, patients have a role in patient-driven, patient-supported care, just like how physicians do. It's, it's a, it's a two-way tango. It's just not one-sided. And I can tell you that I, for one, believe in that concept. And I think the ASM leadership, current leadership, fully understands that. Uh, and so that's a very positive sign uh, so that they would be supporting patient-run programs like this uh, to blossom and grow. Uh, but we don't have nitty-gritties on that It's because it's a little bit early. And, and David's uh, suggestion there about, you know, peer mentors um, having like their section and their kind of own uh, network to, you know, be able to be a resource for each other. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I got this question from this guy or this gal and, and what did you say? Or this is what I said is, you know, um, so we, we, we have that in the works as well, you know, so that they can, you know, have a resource for themselves. And, you know, Dr. Partha Sarathi, as we, as the mentor pool builds up, uh, you know, is, is still working with us to do outreach directly to the mentors, you know, answer any questions they have and kind of use those as additional training and, and, and you know, outreach sessions to, to them specifically. So, yes. And I think one of the key things is, uh, you know, there's only so many venues, you know, we live in an IT-driven world. But during the COVID pandemic, there's a glut of information out there, COVID-related and whatnot. But one of the key things is the other medical conditions that put people at risk uh, for developing COVID. We know sleep apnea is a risk factor for COVID. This is much as obesity, heart disease, and diabetes, because sleep apnea coexists with those three conditions, which are known risk factors. But for some reason, we are not independently recognized as a risk factor for COVID, even though there's research data suggesting that. And so there's a glut of information out there. And so what I would say is, is that if uh, there could be a word of mouth of spreading, you know, the information about if, you know, this free resource that's available there to help benefit patients uh, would also be, you know, very much appreciated. Yep. Are there any final questions that anybody has to type into the chat? Our website's pretty easy, sleepapnea.org.org, and there's a peer mentor section in the nav bar. And then there's a, you know, it drops you down for the mentors and then the uh, patients in need. And you can email us at asaa at sleepapnea.org. That's our general inbox. So if you have any, inf you know, any uh, questions or you want some materials, we'll follow up, um, you know, with getting out the flyers and the social media stuff again. So you have it. 
And we appreciate, like uh, Sarah said, for her and, and others to, you know, share it with your network and your professional friends and family. Um, so any other questions? I don't see any. Thanks for the other people being on camera today. <laughs> so, uh, uh, thanks, thanks for all the great questions. Uh, you know, we, you know and this is a good program. We appreciate your support and time in spending with us and uh, look forward to working and helping you. And these are great suggestions and ideas and uh, we'll take them forward. Yeah, yeah. And if you have any questions at any time, you know, you can uh, reach out to us at the ASA via email call, you know, any direct questions about the program, or I don't know, something's not working for you, or it's just whatever, let us know, let us know. And we'll, you know, we can work with you on that to, to, to address that issue. Great. Thanks, Desmond. Thanks, Sarah, Ravi. Everybody's there. Great. All right. I think that's it, everybody. Thank you so much okay. for your time. We'll follow up with an email with all the information and we hope to uh, talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleephappia.org slash donate for details. SAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.